Uh, thank you. Thank you for hosting me. Uh, what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to uh, give you guys basically an overview of, um, of water treatment uh, and soil remediation, which generally we do in support of uh, projects related to land development. As you might have already heard, brownfields is a very important aspect of, uh, of, 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 of municipal or urban geography that people are trying to reinvigorate places that used to be used to be industrial and, and and what they're trying to do is is that also what they're trying they want us to reuse land that might be contaminated or we might have land that we didn't know that was contaminated but when we checked we found out that wow there's contamination there so that's basically what i'm going to talk about mostly hopefully hopefully i'll try to keep this casual and light uh, like I was teasing um, somebody the other day, I, I, somebody said, well, you're not Iranian. How are you presenting here? I said, well, my wife is Iranian, so I'm going to apply for the citizenship. So anyways, I'll try to keep it light. And if you have a question, feel free to raise your hand or or just 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 interrupt me. I, I have no problem with that, but probably we'll go close to around an hour, um, 45 minutes. I try not to get too much into the details because this is a, mostly an overview. Some people like to ask the technical questions. Some people like just to, uh, just to, just to be familiar with this, all right? And just to, just to start off a presentation, I, 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 I like to give an agenda. Now, what I wanted to do is I wanted to talk a little bit about waste and environmental sectors that we generally work in when, we, when it comes to this type of work. Uh, we'll talk about ex situ water treatment as well as ECAs and in situ soil and groundwater remediation. And so these are the basic areas. But before we get into that, I'd like to introduce who I am. Well, my name is Sajad uh, Mustafa. Uh, I've lived most of my life in uh, in, 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 in United States and, and Canada, but I've also lived in Southern Africa and uh, I've also lived in Pakistan as well. My professional experience is in South Asia, as well as the United States and, um, and, and, and Canada. Now, uh, one of the things that I tell my students and I'll share with you here is, is that, I tend to work to live. Like I, my, my job is not my life. Like if anybody asks me, who are you? I will say I'm the most handsome man from Pakistan or a silly joke like that, or I'm a fabulous cricket player. And, and that's something that helps me uh, in my job as well, and my mental health, especially. Um, now, if you look at my, my qualifications, uh, they, they sound impressive, but they're really, really not that impressive. Most of my experience uh, has helped me gain the knowledge that I have. It's not uh, the education, it's what you do with it afterwards that I feel like really helped me. Yes, you get a theoretical background. Yes, you understand the basics of nature and society, right? But, um, uh, and, and how things became the way they are, as opposed to growing up and people saying, well, Allah did this. I'm like, no, 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 no. I need to know what happened in nature, right? That helped me, that definitely helped me. But as a geoscientist and an engineering technologist and a professional geoscientist, I found that until you are at the site, until you do the thing, you did nothing, you know nothing. That's my personal preference, right? I like it. And it's just like my friends who watch the NHL. I play goalie. I mean, I play goalie with a bunch of old men and I find it so hard. So when they're criticizing Carey Price of Montreal, I'm thinking, you know, sitting on the couch, it looks really easy. And that's the same principle I apply to remediation. I tell my students, you know remediation theoretically, but you know nothing about remediation. And when I started teaching, uh, the Game of Thrones was a very, very interesting show. And, I, and, I, and one of the, my favorite phrases from that is I used to tell my students, be humble. Why? Because you know nothing, Jon Snow. And every time you come across a new project, you never know what you're going to get into. But the main areas where I did focus on remediation or water treatment was in waste management. So in order to uh, reduce the levels of contamination or, 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 or the waste soil that we have to treat or deal with, that's where we used it. Uh, I, I mentioned for brownfields and land development, especially for contaminated sites, uh, environmental impact or environmental site assessments. Uh, sometimes uh, we come to a site and uh, there's a real estate deal. And the reason that the deal won't go through is there might be some contamination on the site. If we can convince the bank and we can convince the buyer and the lender to adjust the prices so that we can use some of that money to treat the soil and groundwater. We want the deal to go through. Do not get me wrong. I work in the environmental sector, but I want industry to be supported. I want people to be able to develop and to uh, have jobs 
to have businesses. So that's you. That's how I look at myself. I'm helping various industries uh, to support them. The other thing that we sometimes do is exit your water treatment, where you pull the water out of the ground, you treat it, and then you pump it. Or for various reasons, water has come out of the ground, out of the subsurface, or it's already out of the ground, it's surface water. And we have some contamination, we need to treat it. Like for example, I'll give you an example where this, this applies. Uh, if you ever look at these stormwater ponds, sometimes every so often you have to dredge them because of the materials that are at the sub at the bottom. You have to remove that material. Before you can do that, you have to pump that water out. And before you pump that water out and send it to a creek where there's a natural habitat, you have to treat it. So that's an example of where ex situ water treatment might occur. And then we have in situ uh, remediation where we the water is in place and then we inject chemicals and we hope to uh, achieve some breakdown of the contaminants. One more area where we're looking at water treatment now for the future is low impact developments. Now, my, my, my focus tonight is not low impact developments, but I just wanted to put that in there, that this is another area that they're going to focus on. Uh, if you ask me, what is the future of water treatment? A low impact development is a form of water treatment where you take storm water and you treat it in such a way that you remove contaminants or you uh, uh, encourage it to infiltrate on site at the source, as opposed to create a flood scenario or too much water downstream. Another area where water treatment is gonna be uh, big is PFAS and PFOAS. But again, we're still learning about that and that's a little bit beyond the scope of my uh, presentation today, but that's, that's some area that we're looking at in the future. So, when <clears throat> what I'd like to do is give you a bit of a regulatory background as well. If you are to treat water or inject chemicals into the ground and, and release it back into the environment, you do have to get an environmental compliance approval. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to use <clears throat> the steps to give you a bit of a background on what the process is. So when we talk about water treatment, at least when I talk about it with my students, I talk about it in three different terms. It's drinking water, the water we pump from the lake, we treat it and it comes to our taps. Wastewater, the water that we flush down the toilets, it goes uh, to a water treatment plant, they treat it and they send it out to the lake. But the area of my focus has always been excavation or, uh, or, or brownfields, groundwater or stormwater, surface water. So in the interest of time, that is what I'm gonna focus on today. Water treatment for excavations or for uh, construction projects. Now, in October 2011, uh, they changed the process of certificates of approvals to, to do treatment, and they started calling it the ECAs, Environmental Compliance Approvals, and the ECERS, or Environmental Activity and Sector Registry. If you are going to be pumping anything into the environment, you need an environmental compliance approval. And so that is that process involves uh, us talking to the ministry and saying, these are the steps we're going to take. This is how we're going to uh, treat the water. And this is what level we're going to achieve. And you send it in as an application. And depending on what type of project you're working on, you might also have to have financial assurance if it's waste related. You know, we do all the bureaucratic stuff, but the main area that they look at in the application is the design and operations report. And that's the technical review that's conducted by the Ministry of the Environment and Climate and, and Conservation and Parks Engineers. Now, here I'd like to point something out to you guys. Every few years, you'll see the Ministry of the Environment change their name. Why does that happen? It's because the government changes. So Doug Ford, he refers to them as MECP, Ministry of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Before that, it was Kathleen Wynne. It was MOECC, Ministry of the Environment and Climate Change, and so on. So that's, that's, that's why... Uh, you might see that discrepancy over time. Now, so they, they, they look at the process that what are you doing in, in terms of treating the water? What are you trying to achieve? And then they'll send you a draft saying, okay, well, this, is, this looks good. And you can, you can now treat the groundwater or stormwater. So let's say we go to a site and uh, they, they are pumping the water. You cannot simply take that water that's in your excavation and pump it to the sewer. You have to check to see whether or not it's contaminated. Or in some cases, you know it's contaminated because you did a phase two environmental site assessment at the site. Now, what, what that is, is, is that uh, when purchasing or when doing a baseline study, sometimes 
uh, financial institutions require a phase one environmental site assessment. And that's environmental due diligence. If there's a chance based on that desktop study and site reconnaissance, that's non-intrusive, no sampling. If there's a chance based on your background study that there could be contamination, you have to uh, recommend a phase two where you drill and you sample. And so based on that, we might already know that there's groundwater impacts. And so when we excavate and we have to deal with the water, we now have a situation where we probably need a, a remediation plan. Another thing I wanted to mention here is, is that an environmental site assessment, phase one, phase two, is different from an environmental impact assessment in that an environmental impact assessment usually is for a big infrastructure project and it's proposing what environmental management needs to be done in the future. Environmental site assessments, usually they look in the past and they look at what is happening now. Okay, so just, just, just be, be careful with that distinction if you are ever talking about environmental site assessments versus environmental impact assessments. Now, another thing that you can do is you can take the soil or the contaminated groundwater and you can create a little bench scale model and you can pour the water through tiny little containers which have the treatment process and you can then see does this actually work so let's now consider a situation where we have groundwater contamination or contaminated water at a construction site usually what we like to do is we like to store it in a holding tank a settling tank the purpose here is to reduce the amount of suspended solids if you let it sit for 24 hours. Secondly, there are situations where there might be uh, chemical contaminants like organics that need to be removed, like an oil water separator. Like this, this, uh, this image here on the right, you can then remove the oil because it might be in a different phase. Now, this could be a little bit tricky because not all the sites have this type of space. Sometimes you might have to block a roadway. And you, you might sometimes see these type of um, uh, structures or, 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 or equipment next to a construction site blocking the roadway. Why? Because they didn't have place on site, but it was important for the process. Then the next thing you would do with the water is you would send it through a couple of filters. Why is that? Even though the suspended material might settle, some might still get through. And it looks like a sock. It's like you pump water through a sock and it's, it's basically under pressure. And you can get it down to having no particles greater than five microns, which is quite small for, for the human eye. Once that happens, the next thing that you can do is you can now use organo clay material. And what it is, is, is that it's basically um, a material that removes any form of organics. Because of its structure, the platelets in the clay structure are such that they remove the material, the organic material. It has great absorptive capacity. What that means is, is that if you run 20, um, if you're running something at um, 20 cubic meters per second, you know, there's a certain amount of contaminant that's flowing through your system at that speed. And you run it through 20 kilograms of clay that 20 kilograms of clay will remove up to 10 kilograms of uh, contamination. And that's what that means, 50% by weight absorptive capacity. So this is a very, very good way of, of, of doing that. Usually, the clay only cleans up to a certain amount. If you have organic compounds that need to be treated in your water, what do I mean by organic compounds? Petroleum hydrocarbons benzene, volatile or, uh, organic compounds like, um, oh shoot, uh, none comes to mind. Oh yeah, PERC, TCE, uh, PERC vinyl chloride. The, the granular carbon helps remove that material. Before, however, here's the, the interesting part. Before you, 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 you mobilize to the site, you probably wanna see how much time and what type of system you wanna set up. Where, what is that based on? Well. If you've got a site which has gravel and sand and you're trying to pump the water up, you're going to need a system that uh, can, can have a, a very fast load of water. Now, let me give you a situation where that's important. If you're constructing a site at a site and you want to build a condo, where do you think they're going to have parking? 
there's not much parking in most places in the GTA. So where do they usually put parking? Underground. And so that's a situation where we could have, uh, we need to pump the water. Now what we do is we check what the water uh, quality is. After that, we check how fast can we pump. And then we set up our system in such a way that we want to maximize the contact time. The reason for that is research says that if you don't have 10 minutes of contact time of the water and your treatment system, which means that it takes 10 minutes for it to pass through at a minimum 10, maybe even more, you could be in trouble. Although this, this chart here indicates that anything over two minutes seems to be relatively effective. But over here, if you look on the right, you might have to have uh, a greater, greater time. It depends on, 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 on how you set up your system. And sometimes you can have it uh, adjusted to where you have a third carbon or a third granular activated carbon as well. Now, just, 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 just let's step back a little bit here. And let me tell you something or, or explain something. Granular activated carbon, it's basically like roasted coconut shells. It's, it's, it's basically very adsorptive material. And what that means is, is that it's, it's got so many nooks and crannies and, and it's got a certain level of porosity that organic compounds love to stick to it. And it looks like a little black, like little black powder as it as it as the water flows through it it's stripping it of contaminants <laughs> there you see the image here it shows how uh how how carbon works now the ideal um activated carbon activated carbon means you you've got it it's roasted it's ready to go and then you wet it a little bit you want to have a mesh size of about eight uh, by 30 inches <clears throat> As I mentioned earlier, the residence time is about 10 minutes that you're looking for. And that usually gives you the maximum performance. Now, when you submit this to anybody, whether it's the ministry or whether it's to your client who might have their own engineers who's reviewing it, you want to have, uh, you want to show this treatment train. And this basically summarizes what we've been talking about earlier. You've got your incoming contaminated water. Now, maybe you stored it in a, in a sediment tank, maybe not. Here, we're assuming that we didn't. Then you've got your uh, filter vessel that removes up to anything greater than five microns in size, in diameter. And then you've got the secondary filter bag that removes anything uh, up to one micron in diameter. After that, you pass it through your organo clay, followed by carbon, granular activated carbon. Now, this here so far has removed suspended solids, sediments, TSS, and a lot of the, a lot of the uh, uh, parameters that are, that are inorganic. Then you've got the organo clay and the granular carbon that removes the, uh, the organic materials. But sometimes you end up with metals or items similar to metals that, uh, that, that you can add another vessel to, and that might have green sand or activated alumina to remove inorganic parameters. I think that the activated alumina does quite well for everything but manganese. And manganese, uh, you can use green sand. That's the new technology that we're seeing. Here's another uh, good infographic showing uh, the entire process. In this case, we've also got the uh, oil water separator as well. Now, this would ha this doesn't happen as often anymore. Why? Because over the past 20 odd years, we've cleaned up most of the sites that have these issues. We have significant amounts of contamination. It still could happen like at a gas station or an old gas station, but it doesn't happen as often as it used to where I think back in the 90s when I started working, um, every, I mean, every third gasoline site would have uh, this type of remediation system required. So <clears throat> it's interesting. When we start up a system like this, we check for um, whether it's all working, do we have any leaks, and we let it wet for 24 hours. You can't simply turn on the system and start thinking that's going to work properly. You have to check. You have to make sure that it's working properly. And it, maybe your goal is to go at, 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 at 200 gallons an hour. Or, or a minute, but instead you start off with three, four, 10 gallons per minute, slower rate, let's check, let's see what's going on. For me, my um, 
uh, one of the projects I worked on that was really successful was, was where we were pumping at about uh, 70 to 75 liters a minute. It was quite quite successful, but we couldn't do that right from the start. We had to connect everything, and then we had to check, is it actually working? And before you can start pumping into the sewer, you have to sample as well. Okay, and then, so what we're trying to do is we're trying to make sure that the fines are removed and that the system is actually working. And as I said, we tend to take an in, input sample, an influence sample between our treatment vessel sample and a final effluent sample. Why? Because we want to see how the system is performing. We tend to also monitor pH at the site, and we, we, we look at um, what I would call aesthetics, right? I, I joke with my students. I said, you know, there's a certain thing where we can take a sample of the water and we can say, oh, the water looks clear. That's actually quite important in some situations, or does it smell? And it's, qual it's, 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 qual it's qualitative as opposed to quantitative, which the laboratory analysis will give. And I always teach my students, I said, it's just like, you could say, Sajjad is a very, very ugly man. So that would be a qualitative analysis. Or you could say, Sajjad is six foot two inches tall. That is a quantitative analysis where there's a number attached to it, right? Like somebody said to me, oh, 55 centimeters of snow, that is quant. And so that's important for us to keep in mind both because even if it meets criteria and it looks bad, it's not, it's not a good look for the city or for your client. Initially, we suggest that before you pump, uh, while you're pumping out, you check the system and take samples every 50,000 liters up to 250,000 liters. And then after that, every 250,000 liters. I always tell people that the minute you stop paying attention to your system, that's when something will go wrong. So it's a good to have people on site watching the system as it performs. I don't like to have a system running and nobody's there. I know some people have done that and, I, and I've seen that end up in a very bad situation. Now, what do we do when we're monitoring? Well, we're checking to see, do we need to replace the carbon? Because after a certain amount of time, when it's removed enough contamination, it needs to be replaced. So what we do is we replace that. And what we're doing is, is that we're checking. So let's say you've got the first carbon. Once the contamination breaks through the first carbon, <clears throat> before it reaches the second carbon, that's when we change the system. We do this in, so we have the carbon vessels in series. Why? Because we don't want even the minutest chance of any contamination reaching these storm sewers or even these sanitary sewers. The difference between the storm and sanitary sewers being is that the sanitary sewers tend to be going to a wastewater effluent plant whereas the storm sewers go straight to a natural surface water body. <clears throat> so <clears throat> this is a, uh, the old application form. And usually it takes about a, I'd say, let's see, um, eight to 12 months. But because I started to actually get pretty good at it, I started receiving approvals within three months. So I was pretty happy with myself. Uh, but it depends on the reviewer, it depends on how busy they are. Recently, what I've been seeing with ECAs, um, as well as record of site conditions, is that the ministry has a lot of stuff that was backed up during the, the pandemic uh, months. And, and now a lot of people, because of the, um, you know, because of the uh, vaccines and everything, are starting to feel comfortable to reinvest. Although who knows now with, uh, uh, with, with wars happening in other places, what's going to happen. So that ends my first portion. Does anybody have any question right now? Okay, so I'll just continue then. I'm really glad that at least one person has his camera on. Usually my students, they don't have their camera on. I always tell my students, if, you, if they ask me for a reference, I will say, this is what you look like. And so then that gets them to turn on their camera and they start talking to me. All right, so... The next type of uh, uh, item that I'd like to look at is, is that in-situ remedial technologies. In-situ means in place. Ex-situ means taking it out of place. And what we were talking about so far was ex-situ. Now I wanna talk a little bit about in-situ. There's two main types of remediation that we do in-situ. Chemical oxidation, so it's ISCO, Institute Chemical Oxidation, or Institute Chemical Reduction. We can also do some bioremediation, although I haven't done that for a while. And we can install a permeable reactive barrier. So we'll cover 
all of these topics. So in situ remediation, as I said, it's talking about a soil and groundwater treatment in place. And its application is dependent on different factors. You can't simply go to a site and say it's going to work every time. Geology, water table, timelines are an issue. For example, if you have a site and you have the money and you want to develop it within two months, it's better to just dig it all up, spray, seed the site with chemicals, fill, backfill it, and you're good to go. But sometimes that's not possible. Why is that not possible? Because they have infrastructure in place or they have, <clears throat> they have a building and they don't, want to, they don't want to remove the building or they don't want to spend a million dollars or $500,000. So you can do institute chemical oxidation. It takes longer, but in many cases it can get the job done. The types of projects I worked on for that type of remediation are ISCO, that's that listed there, Institute Chemical Oxidation, ISCR, Institute Chemical Reduction, <clears throat> Surfactant Washing, that's basically like soap, dye injections, which just helps you understand where the groundwater is going, or bioremediation. So in Institute Chemical Oxidation, what we're trying to do is we're targeting specific bonds of the chemicals that we're trying to break down. <clears throat> the oxidant is the electron receptor, and it's reduced by the reaction. Now, because we're breaking those bonds, which are usually these long organic compounds, stronger oxidants like Fenton's reagents also attack a, a, a greater uh, number of contaminants. You can also use hydrogen peroxide, sodium persulfate, sodium permanganate, but it, it can be a little bit tricky because you want to have an alkaline solution for those type of situations. So sometimes you have to actually inject a base or uh, an alkali before you actually get the pH. Because naturally the pH might be between 6.5 and 7.7 .7 or 8.1. You know, I'm just throwing out numbers close to neutral. But you want it to be 11 or 12. And so it gets a little bit tricky uh, for those type of situations. I really like using a, a direct push geoprobe to pump my chemicals into the ground. Why? Because I can move around. And as long as I have the locates and I don't know where the utilities are, I can inject the chemical into the ground at specific locations. What we're trying to do is we're trying to break down the contaminants to what are considered relatively harmless to the environment. Additionally, we are using chemicals that if they stay in the environment will also be rendered harmless over a short period of time. When does this become an issue? If for some reason this injection is pumping chemical into the ground and it goes into a creek or river, that becomes an issue. Or if we inject into the ground and it gets into somebody's home, into the basement. So you want to be very careful about that. Now, <clears throat> it's really a good technology because it can break down a wider a range of contaminants like polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons uh, in, in addition to um, VOCs and PACs as well as pesticides. The good news about pesticides is it generally resides near the surface. We don't usually have pesticides in the groundwater. That's usually a soil, a shallow soil issue. And that's also the case for metals as well. Otherwise, then you're looking at some other, other, other issues that you'd have to, other ways to deal with it. Now, some contaminants are more, uh, need more aggressive work. And so sometimes you, do, you can do a bit of an analysis. Do you want to use sodium hydroxide? So the, because of the oxidation reduction potential, if you look at that, it's, two, it's minus 2.7 as opposed to hydrogen peroxide. Now, I don't want this to turn into a chemistry lecture, but I did, I did think that that would be valuable for you guys to at least see what it is. Now, me, what do I usually use? What do I usually use in, in, in our work? It's usually uh, sodium persulfate, uh, and uh, sodium per, or potassium permanganate. Those are the two that we use a lot of. Now, here's a reaction that might happen with potassium permanganate, and you've got it addressing a perchloroethene. It could be from a dry cleaner. It could be from some other activities. It could be from an old industrial plant where they use solvents to clean the equipment. And essentially, you're breaking it down to uh, magnesium oxide, carbon dioxide, you've got potassium chloride, and you've got some hydrogen there. So relatively uh, benign uh, chemicals, compounds are in the ground. 
Now, in situ chemical reduction is the mirror image where you inject a reductant as opposed to an oxidant. Everything else is the same. In this case, the uh, injected chemical is oxidized as opposed to the previous case, right? Another, another thing that, that, that can happen is, is that you can also inject chemicals into the ground to dissolve metals as well and, and, and cause them to precipitate and become solid. Why will that be helpful? Because the same amount of chemical in the dissolved form is considered a higher contaminant than when in a solid form by an order of 1,000. Why is that? Because we don't tend to drink soil. We do drink water. And so th that's why sometimes what we can do is we don't need to remove the material. We just need to inject something that precipitates the chemical and makes it solid. Where would I use chemical reduction? It doesn't happen that often, but certain pesticides, explosives. Uh, like, for example, we work at a plant um, where they built uh, bombs. Uh, we could use it there, uh, but we ended up using a different technology. We used X2. I'm glad uh, because I, I don't want to go back to that site. Uh, I just felt a bad feeling because weapons of death were created there during the wars. Uh, and, and so when we went there, we actually, I actually said to my friends, I said, let's get out of here. I think there's genies here. There's gins. And the Canadians are like, what do you mean gins? I said, you know, all those ghost stories. <laughs> but seriously, when we go to these old sites, there's a history. And that history needs to be learned. And sometimes it's painful when you hear that history. Then you have a, you have a different history. We had a project in uh, the Middle East. And they said there was oil here. And we said, what was the oil here for? Oh, they said, well, when uh, the Crusaders were trying to burn Salahuddin's forces, they would pour oil on them. And we were laughing because, you know, when you go back in time, many of the chemicals, if you go back long enough, will have decayed or eroded away. But in North America, we don't deal with those timelines. Another thing is, is that we had a very significant manufacturing base across North America. So you never know what you're going to come across. And that's why we have these various tools. Now, when it comes to chemical reductant, a zero valent iron is what can be used. And it, it, basically, uh, it basically becomes uh, oxidized increasing its valency to Fe2 plus or Fe3 plus. I, I'm not sure exactly, don't quote me on that, but it's basically becomes ferric or ferrous as opposed to zero valent. So <clears throat> one way that zero valent iron really helps us is this. we can dig a trench and then we can place this iron into a, uh, into, the, into the sand, mix it in and place it so that it creates a barrier. And we know, if, as long as we know which way the groundwater is flowing, by the time it goes through a few of these barriers, it is already treated. And you don't have to touch that for a significant period of time. You do wanna have monitoring wells beyond the barriers to make sure that it's working. This is also a way that we can use uh, bioremediation. In recent times, I have used bioremediation here as well, where you introduce bugs. So if you see this trench over here, I might have some injection pipes. And then I will introduce different types of microbial, micro, uh, uh, microbial life forms. Why? Because the organic compounds that are coming from the, uh, from the, from the uh, plant might serve as food. So what is chemical contamination to us, to microbes? It's kobide kebab. So they will reduce it. It's, it's food for them. So... <clears throat> This is where we're talking about uh, that, where you can mix the zero valent iron with food grade carbon substrates and that stimulates the bacteria. But you know, one of the best uh, manufacturers for this was FMC Adventist, and I think they hold the license. I haven't used this term in for a while, but uh, I remember it being quite successful. And this was at a, a Department of Defense uh, contractors uh, place here, a Canadian Department of Defense. I was working there. It's a very sensitive site. Uh, I actually had to give them my passport as well. It was very, until I finished the project. Maybe they think I'm going to spy for Pakistan. Who knows? Anyway, so Duramend is a, is a patented uh, combination of slow release uh, fibrous uh, carbon, organic carbon, and it has nutrients. 
the microbial bacteria are actually living in the soil naturally as well. So that's what this does. But we are trying to look at better, uh, better, better technologies to introduce to the environment, which have um, microbes that we uh, grow or we enhance them in on site, and then we inject them into the ground. Another thing that we have to keep in mind is that sometimes we don't need to do anything. All we have to do is inject air. Why? Because there are, as I said earlier, there's naturally occurring bacteria in the subsurface that are just need a bit of air and they get stimulated. So understanding the aerobic versus anaerobic is, is very, very important as well. <clears throat> okay, all right. So I think, I think we've covered most of that. Now let's take a look at a typical system uh, which has uh, mixing tanks, pumps, flow meters, uh, pressure gauges, piping, and so on. Oops, I don't think I have that here. Okay, I'll, I think, I think I, I'll have it in a later slide. But remember I said to you guys, you have to know certain things before you go and do site remediation. Well, this is a list of things that I would recommend that you should know. Site geology, concentrations of contaminants, site aquifer properties, infrastructure, oxidants. I tend to avoid doing the calculations because we have had experts that can calculate how much is needed. But I have been a part of that, but I try to avoid it now. And for example, when we need to order compounds uh, to do the injections, we, um, we have a partner, they're known as Chemco. They help us as well. By the way, they're gonna be at the conference I'm gonna go to, Vertex, as it holds a conference, it's called Smart Remediation. And they talk about all the latest things that are happening in remediation. So there you go, you've got your uh, typical uh, design set up for, um, this would be for a, a permanent non-mobile treatment plant where you've got your, your housing of the, uh, of the uh, reagent. This is where you've got the mixing taking place and then it's pumped through the pump uh, into <clears throat> permanently existing wells. And hopefully you're able to reach the zone of contamination. Now the array of the injection is, is calculated by looking at what could be the zone of influence based on uh, based on the geology and the pressure with which you're injecting. Uh, Sina, did you have, Sina Ferozzi, did you have a question? Okay, okay, I think. I oh, I'm I... sorry, actually. Um, Sajid, thank you for asking. Uh, do I leave it for later on? This is okay, really sure. Cool. sure. Thank you. I, I think that I'll be done quite shortly. I don't have too many slides left. I have a few, but I don't have too many. But I think we've got the gist of it. But this is what I, I hate to talk about something or have words and without having a diagram. You know, it's very hard to understand what we're talking about if you don't have a diagram. Now, <clears throat> you could have wells that are two, four, six inches in diameter. You could have stainless steel, but I found that most chemicals that we inject, we can use PVC as well. Usually, another another way that we can inject is with a direct push geoprobe. In this case, it's not temp, it's not permanent, it's temporary, and you just you basically drive onto the site with your chemical mixing plant, and you hook it up to a geoprobe, which is like a it's a drill rig, and it pushes into the ground. Just imagine if soil is like a cake, one of my friend used to say, different layers of cake, and you take a straw and you push the straw into the ground like you're Superman if you you did it in nature. That's what a geoprobe is. I mentioned the uh, permeable barrier. That's basically what injection trenches are as well, except they're not, they're not that deep. They're not deep into the aquifer. What they are is that they're a reservoir that allow for the chemical to, to slowly infiltrate and percolate to the groundwater. They act as a reservoir. And what you do is in, in, in your trenches, you go, you, you, you put a pipe, which is, uh, which is, um, uh, which it allows for the flow of that chemical, and then it allows it to uh, enter into the trench. And let me show you how, how, how it's constructed. So you've got your big old pipe right here. Uh, let's see, over here with a screen, you inject from over here, from, from, from the top or over here, and it in infiltrates into the gravel or sand that's surrounding it, or in this case, pea gravel. And this is a cross-section from the other side. Uh, this is a side view. This is a cross-sectional view. And this acts as a reservoir. And you come and you fill it up every three or four weeks. And it slowly goes into the ground and it disperses. Diffusion takes place okay, in nature. 
As mentioned earlier, before we can actually create a proper plan, we would look at a phase two report or look at the remediation action plans and also check the laboratory data. We probably wanna have an estimate <clears throat> how much water we're dealing with. Like we wanna look at the porosity of the soil. Is it 25% porosity? What's the depth of the aquifer? What's the hydraulic conductivity? We might wanna go out and do some hydro uh, hydraulic testing where you pump water out of the ground and you watch how long it takes for it to stabilize and then determine Darcy's, what, what type of Darcy's law is, is applicable here, right? The stoichiometric calculations is basically, you determine if we have 100 kilograms of contaminant di di dispersed over an area, how long would it take to pump that contaminant or inject chemicals to treat that contaminant? And what type of chemistry should we use? What concentration of oxidant should we use? Because we can't just take the oxidant and in a very pure form start pumping it. We might kill ourselves. It's, it's, it's very severe burns can happen. Another thing I wanted to point out is, is that you need to be very good about your health and safety. It's very important. Even one time I didn't check my wire and, and it started to get damaged. And the site manager was very upset because, you know, uh, what happens is sometimes the chemicals, they, they spray and they can start eating away at your wiring and things like that. So all, you want to be very, very careful. You want to protect yourself. I once went to a party. I didn't realize that the clothing I was wearing, it got a little bit of the chemical on it and it changed the entire color of my shirt. So here you go, you've got, you've got a, an image showing the chemistry, not, not my area, not anymore, but this is basically what they're doing. They're checking to see how much contaminant is there and how much chemical they need based on that. Now, sometimes we'll, I remember in the US, in the Southern states, we would assemble a house. The only problem with that is, I don't know if I should laugh or I should cry. When you open the house, sometimes a poor guy, homeless guy would be living there. And so you wanted to be careful. And uh, our mandate was don't bother him if possible. You know, do your work, but don't kick him out or her out. And so sometimes, you know, people have a tough life. But if you have it properly secured, you shouldn't have that issue. But the reason for having it secured is if you have a hurricane in the US or here in Canada, if you have a snowstorm, you want it to be heated. You want it to be protected. Because one of the problems with this equipment, it's, if it's going to be on site for many years, is, is that the, the weather affects it. And when you're injecting liquid, do you think you want to expose that to the Canadian winter? I don't think that's a good idea. Because usually what happens is that then you'll have damage, you'll have a pipe burst, and it could, it, you, you'll have a chemical going everywhere. But this is, what, um, this is what one of those trailers might look like inside, right? And, and, and <coughs> I liked working when we had one of these, because it's heated. No matter what, or in the winter or in the summer, it's cooler inside. So here's where you've got a, a, a mobile plant where you've got the chemicals and you've got your mixing going on over here. And then you've probably got a pump somewhere that's pumping it into the ground. So this is more of a mobile setup. And then after you think you've got enough chemical in the ground, you wanna monitor your wells. You want to sample your water, see where you're at. You try, you avoid sampling the same wells that you injected in, or you have to purge them very, very well. Usually you leave the monitoring wells as separate and the injection wells as separate. According to the regulations, they should be separate. And according to the regulations, if you're working with the Ministry of the Environment, once the remediation is done, you have to sample for about a year. Because sometimes what happens is that you think you finished the remediation, but two, three, six months later, it came back rebound. So that's why you have to be quite careful in these type of projects. And so that's basically a summary of in-situ water treatment and soil treatment. Uh, a, a big difference is when you're dealing with water versus soil is soil usually has much higher concentration levels. And usually what we try to do is if we can find where the contamination by, is by soil, maybe through a laser study or some other survey, GPR looking for any place where there's old sources, we wanna at least dig up the main source of contamination because like I said, it's usually in a much higher concentration there. In terms of water, if I can get my chemical to contact the water that's contaminated, you will have a successful cleanup. The question is, can I get my oxidant to the contamination? Thank you for attending.
Okay, Sina, you had a question. First of all, thank you so much, Saja, for your uh, You're welcome. kind uh, presentation. I appreciate it very much. This is a very big area, especially Iranians are very, very concerned about that, not only on the you know, construction, you know, in the construction field and all, but coming from Iran, as you can uh, share that with me, we come from uh, areas of so much uh, polluted uh, yes. uh, soil and uh, contaminated and also uh, my specific question actually uh, you cover so many areas uh, i was wondering if you have exposure to salt yes uh, test interesting interesting you bring up salt we try to avoid dealing with salt and the, the one way that they did is, is they pump it out and they just change the ph they change the ph or change the temperature changes the solubility i personally only worked on the design because when we started to do the work the ministry of the environment started to say if it is going to continue to be road salt it is no longer con considered contamination as long as they keep using that area for poor roadway but in the past what they would do is they try to change the temperature change the ph or they would add a chemical to cause precipitation of the salt that was usually the way they did it. Also, I believe activated aluminum might help as well because it would get rid of the potassium or sodium. Thank you so much. You're welcome. It's interesting you bring up Iran because that's partly where I got into groundwater or water uh, because I, 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 I would, I, when I was living as a teenager in Pakistan, I, I ended up getting sick because of contaminated water. Unfor unfortunately, the situation has not changed there much, but I do fund projects when I get the money to, to build mini plants or wells for drinking water for poor people in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. wow. Wonderful. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, because, you know, one of the things that annoys me as heck is, is um, there's a lot of poor people that could use a lot of help. And yet uh, we, we tend to focus on how to get rich or, you know, how many times did you go to the mosque? Like those things, you know, you can do good things that actually help people instead of, oh, I'm going to get this car or I'm going to do this. Or I, yeah, I, I feel like there's a lot of work to be done over there. And unfortunately, the systems aren't in place where there's not a lot of water treatment that should be happening. Uh, we did have, a, I worked in a company, we did have people who were working on water treatment because we had a lot of tanneries in the industrial sector in, uh, in Karachi. And, 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 but it, it usually was outside funding. And that became quite complicated uh, after the um, uh, September the 11th, because anybody who brought in funding and NGOs, a lot of the locals looked at them suspiciously. Since you mentioned that, if you don't mind just taking your time a little bit, uh, uh, because you mentioned about uh, precipitation as one way of basically diluting, right? Chemical the, precipitation, yeah. yeah. How about the other way? I mean, uh, evaporation. Yeah, you something. can do that. Yeah, okay. Yeah, you can you can do that. Unfortunately, the pro the problem with that is that might um, uh, that might cost a lot of money to generate that much heat. Like if you have a large project and you have a large parking lot, you're looking at you know several thousands of cubic meters of water, and uh, I don't think we're I don't think the ministry would allow us to to generate that much heat. Or, 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 or to have that much evaporation. I think that's a good question though. Like, can we capture that? Uh, but, I, but the reason that I understand that we probably wouldn't do that is the cost of the electricity to heat that much water or the fuel to burn. The solar and things like that. Maybe. Yeah, then now we have more options. Definitely, definitely. I'm gonna probably ask that someplace, but that's definitely a good idea for salt. But like I said, now, if you are leaving the site as a road area, ministry does not consider that contamination anymore. Thank you. Uh, Mohammed. Yes, thank you. Um, actually, I had uh, two, three questions that one of them was common with Sina. Um, if possible, I'm starting with the first one, which is, um, is it happened that, because these things that you, uh, you said this remediations or these plants or stations are for uh, kind of man-made systems that you're going to remedy something. Yes. Um, <clears throat> first, is it, um, as far as I heard, is it uh, for construction sites even? When yes. you're digging? Okay. Yes. 
Uh, secondly, that, yeah, they're sorry. the ones who have the most money, like because the construction sites have the money to pay for this. Because remediation can cost in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. Mm -hmm. But they are not they are not the cause of that making that the no no unless okay. they um, the only time they're a cause is if they are digging and there's mm -hmm. a tank in the ground that they didn't know was there. It's happened to us. Right. But yeah. because it's very quick, you see it right then, you can dig it up as opposed mm -hmm. to having a leak that happened 20 years ago. Now it's mm -hmm. spread far and wide. So you yeah. see that you hit it and you can clean it up quickly. Because if anybody here is a hydrogeologist or a, chem or a civil engineer, they know subsurface flow is very slow compared to surficial flow. So yes, mm -hmm. it's very rare that the land developer caused it. It's usually something that happened in history. Okay, thank you. Um, the the other thing that related to this is, uh, is it happened that sometimes go to the nature and do that uh, remedy? I mean, you find maybe reported something and then we do that. Yeah, we do it that happens. only uh, only if we need to use that water for drinking water. So if mm -hmm. we go to a site and there's a natural level of uranium there that all the documentation reports that we wouldn't treat that. Like if it's naturally at that level, we wouldn't treat that unless we are going to drink the water. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, there are, there are exceptions to that. Like for example, if we take that water and we, we wanted to pump it and we wanted to transport it to another receiving area and that receiving area, that receiving lake or creek does not have that level of uranium, then yes, you would also uh, take away naturally occurring uh, concentrations as well. But it's, I've never experienced that, by the way. I think I only had that once at one site where we had concentrations of uranium that were a little bit higher. But the ministry at the time said, you don't need to do anything about it because it's naturally occurring. I think it was Bancroft or north of Bancroft. Yep. Okay, thank you very much. Romina, I know that uh, you have your question, but if you let me just the last one and then I promise to go out. Sure. Um, yeah, no. Thank you. Uh, the, the last one is what uh, Sina mentioned. Um, I know that in just in Ontario, we have almost 5 million tons of uh, road salting for the, yeah. each year. Yeah. Uh, and always I'm thinking that this much of salt, uh, finally, maybe in 20 years or 30 years, from now that I am here, uh, we have this, just this, this freshwater lake, Ontario or other lakes. Uh, is, isn't it a concern for the yes. ministry to yes. somehow control it or something? Yes. Yeah, yeah, they, they, it is a concern. And actually uh, this summer, we proposed some research projects to see the impacts of road salts on the natural environment. Uh, it is something that is becoming more and more studied for sure. They want to get away from road salts because of surface water bodies, like the natural surface water bodies. And that's another reason why they like LIDs, low impact developments, that if you're using road salts at your facility, you're not letting that water with the salt go to a nearby naturally occurring water body. Because if it gets there to the subsurface, the soil infiltrates, uh, the soil filters it. So it's a natural treatment system. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you are creating problems for the naturally occurring habitats for sure. And yes, it flows into the ocean uh, from Lake Ontario, but still, it's not a good idea to have salts mixing with the surface water body. That is, you are correct. And we just haven't gotten around to treating it as, as well as we should. So we can have a hope that someday yes. it will be eliminated. Okay, thank yes. you so much. I'm done. Thanks. Thank you. Romina. Uh, first of all, thank you for a very impressive uh, presentation. Uh, since I'm engineer uh, and then project manager, uh, I just wanted to know if we have, if we have a site to develop for, uh, for, for industrial development, I mean, for example, building our, a pharmaceutical plant or a chemical plant. And then usually what we have uh, before even you get permits, we have geologists going there and then inspect the soil. And then if there is a water contamination or something, they will actually give us a report. Yes. Um, uh, it's for foundation uh, building, engineering, field, and all of those use, and also for permits as well. Yes. I just wanted to know, is it... Uh, part of like, I know this is necessary for industrial, 
but uh, is it also uh, required, like mandatory for uh, building, like, yes. uh, uh, you know, residential? <coughs> yes. Yes, because uh, when you submit the application to the city, they're going to ask for the phase one and phase two and water quality reports. And if you don't have that, you have to come up with a remediation plan. And if you don't have a remediation plan, they might ask you to create one if there is contamination. But yeah, it depends. If you have contamination, then yes, you do have to come up with the remediation and water treatment. Recently, we, a few years ago, uh, it's on Coxwell in, in Toronto, we did do a project where we not only had to have a remediation plan, but we put in a permanent treatment. Oh, okay. and, it's, and it's interesting because that one, the water was not going to the natural environment, to the creek, it was going to the sanitary sewer. So what we ended up doing is we had to get a permit from the city to even install the treatment system. Because that was a municipal sewer that the water was going to. And the reason for that is, is that all the groundwater that they were pulling up to lower the parking garage, uh, the water level under the parking garage, had impact. Oh, okay. Thank and you then, so much. And that was identified during the uh, uh, the SPA, the application that our clients submitted to the city yeah. to redevelop the site. Okay. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Anybody else has a question? I think Mr. Afshin, this topic was very interesting for you because you're a builder. Mr. Afshin might have stepped away or he's on mute. Yeah. Um, okay, I got another question, Sajjad. Um, based on my uh, observation, I'm not I'm not a chemical uh, expert or things. My last uh, study in chemical was uh, around 25 years ago in high school. Um, what I've uh, observed in um, when I'm going underground with the um, concrete buildings, the um, the water coming out that uh, penetrated already from uh, surface to the uh, concrete and comes out, it's, it seems very acid uh, situation because uh, even it's, uh, it's burning out the insulation of the wires or these things. Um, is there anything for these kind of things? Because lots of concrete buildings that we're making and is it uh, recognized already that uh, they have effect with this? I mean, this concrete right. uh, mixing with the uh, with the water. Yeah, yeah. So the cement might make it alkaline, or or like you said, there might be some chemical mixing. Usually, what we try to do is we try to have a sump pump to lower the water table, but that only lowers the water table of the naturally occurring groundwater. <clears throat> the other thing that they're trying to do is they're trying to have weeping tiles. And what that is, is, is that <clears throat> that's a structure next to the foundation where the water from the building, it seeps into. Mm -hmm. And so that it doesn't get into the foundation. I, I have not worked on any of the project that you described, but only I see my engineers in the office, they design weeping tiles and they help them design the system to lower the water table or to have the water go dissipate underneath the foundation so that it doesn't get stuck under the foundation and cause a problem that you were mentioning. Sure, but uh, so the nature of these things is alkaline, not acid. Yeah? I think it's alkaline. I'm not exactly sure because it's cement, right? Concrete. Yeah, so what? Cement. What is it in, in in cement or concrete? Does it does it not create an alkaline? I'm not sure. I'm not the expert. Mm. Okay, okay. Yeah. that's enough. Yeah, because the I thought thing... that concrete raises the pH, so that means it's alkaline. Okay, but still, uh, with uh, with those remediation or precaution that you're telling, you're telling. Uh, that water goes in, into the soil and the in, into environment. It anyways. can, and, and it can also degrade. Uh, degrade. Mm -hmm. Degrade the structure. Yeah, that the structure is the uh, expertise of Afshin, that uh, he's a structure, he must be look after these, this problem. But now if, if you're talking about the environment, 
still that contaminated contaminated water goes inside into the in environment that is correct that is correct okay. but generally they don't worry about it uh, from an environmental point of view like we don't go there looking to test and say hey your cement is causing contamination usually mm -hmm. our company when they're there they just want to see is it causing structural damage because i work okay. with many different people right we don't go there to cause problems for our clients <laughs> unless unless they have to do something for the environment we don't tell them to do it because we want to help them spend their money right yeah sure and and and, and when you, when you start chasing contamination everywhere on site it can become a problem now now if they do have an issue with the water with the structure we would treat it if it needs to be treated it, it has happened we had water from a roof that was not allowed to go into a drain because it was picking up some manganese and so we had to put a treatment system uh, in place so that it could be treated another place we had a foundational situation i didn't work on this project i just know about it they had they had they had a weeping towel so they had a, a conduit underneath mm -hmm. the foundations Mm -hmm. It collected in one spot, and from that one spot, it went to this sanitary sewer. Okay. We sampled there, mm -hmm. and it turned out that it was creating impacts to the uh, to the sewer. It was a little bit too high, so uh, what they did is they put in it was TSS, so they put in some mesh material. Mm -hmm. So when mm -hmm. it flowed through it, it removed a lot of the TSS, the suspended yeah. solids, and yeah. it was now under under the criteria for the city bylaws. Okay. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for being uh, patient with me and letting me speak on the Thursday. Yes, Romina. I know you're tired, me. It's my last question. I just want to know um, uh, how um, people, um, young engineer, actually uh, go to that path to be expert in inspection and water treatment, uh, soil remediation? Is it uh, any specific uh, area they should study, certification? Um, right. Yeah. right. So you can look at the colleges. Um, you, the colleges have some program. I teach in the college. Uh, University of Toronto has a remediation program. They, they teach the theory. But after that, uh, you want to work in a company that does the remediation. So one of those companies is uh, Vertex. I find them to be a very good company. So if anybody here is listening and wants to get into it, go to their smart conference, smart remediation conference. Uh, they will have all the remediation people there. And I, I tell my students that, you know, you have to go out and meet people because sometimes they just don't know you based on your resume. Right. And so what happened is, is that a lot of my students did go and a few of them got hired. Uh, so what I suggest is you get a basic background whether it's a diploma or a degree, I just put it in the in the in the share. I, I just get a basic basic background, and then all you need to do is is then uh, learn and go out and and watch experts do it. But when you do do it with experts, you want to spend significant number of years with them. That's how I learned the best in remediation. I didn't learn it from a school or from a book. I learned it from people while they were doing it, because sometimes it didn't work. And then we looked at why it didn't work and all the little problems that we encountered. And we tried to avoid those problems the next time. I remember I was considered to uh, not have injected enough chemical in one day. I injected 15,000 liters one day. They said, no, 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 no. It has to be 25,000 liters. Okay. Yeah. And so, you know, Is until I did it, I didn't learn that. Sorry. Yeah. Also, you want to be good with tools and you want to be like a plumber. <laughs> So is it is it uh, always uh, when when we are on site and we want to treat water uh, is it always chemical like uh, I'm sure we we maybe not sure uh, we cannot have reverse osmosis there or... yes you can use that one as well I haven't used it so yeah. that's why I didn't I didn't talk on reverse osmosis mm -hmm. like for example that the the, uh, the water treatment plant and drinking water plant that I'm installing in Pakistan I didn't do the technical work I just helped get the money to fund it. And they're using reverse osmosis. Okay. And, and when I asked for the technical they details, they didn't share. <laughs> they didn't want me to know. <laughs> they don't want me to take away their work. <laughs> Doing the best thing. You're making money, uh, preparing money for that. Uh, I think that's uh, for now. It's okay. Thank you so much. Uh, Thank you. So I, I don't know if I share this, but let me try to do this again. Um, 
I, I forgot to share this screen. Sorry about that. So if anybody has a question uh, afterwards, you can um, can still uh, you can still look me up. Okay. Yeah, sure. I appreciate that. So I'll try to uh, now that that's where I'll end. So I'll try to type it in the chat as well. That's kind of you, Richard. I usually it's 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 it's, it's, it's not um, it's usually not a big deal to answer questions. So depends on the question though. <laughs> I have one friend sometimes, you know, she likes to help get my input and it's like a, she hired me for the project but no pay. <laughs> <laughs> so it depends, right? And then I have to say, hey, I have time or I don't have time and then work with my schedule. For sure. But that's a good attitude, helping others. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. So um, thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, any any other question? Anybody else has any question? Thank you. Thank you, Nasser. Thank you, Sina. Take care. Thank you, Hadi. Thank you. It's done, yeah. I would, I would like to again uh, thanks uh, Sajad to to be our presenter in Mandis. And um, yeah, thank you so much for your time and uh, everything. Yeah, take and, care, uh, guys. Thank, thank you. you. Have a good, Have a good day. Have a good Thanks. evening. Good night. Bye, everybody. Bye. Good night. Bye.